Appreciate that scripture reading. We're not going to return to that passage in our study this afternoon, but it very much sets forth the, the special relationship that the apostles would be sharing with the Holy Spirit after our Lord's departure. We're going to be talking, as we've announced, we're going to be talking this afternoon about the Holy Spirit and the apostles, and about the special relationship that the Holy Spirit shared with these select individuals. In order to properly understand the will of God, we must rightly divide His Word. In the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 2 and verse 15, Paul writes to Timothy and says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. The old King James Version says, Study. Study to show yourself approved unto God so you can do what? So that you can rightly divide the word of truth. The New American Standard Version, I believe it is, says to handle accurately the word of truth. If we're going to rightly divide, if we're going to handle it accurately, if we are going to correctly discern God's will from the Scriptures, then as we're reading it, we need to pay very close attention to who is speaking at the time. Who is it that's doing the talking, and what is it that they are saying? What is the message that they are conveying? And sometimes, as is the case with our study this afternoon, it's important that we understand exactly who is being spoken to. There are some commands and instructions in the Scripture that are universal in their application, but there are others that only apply to specific individuals or to specific groups of people. Uh, This is illustrated very easily by me asking the question, how are you coming along on your ark? How are are you doing building your ark and constructing your ark? Well, obviously you're not. That was an instruction that was just given to Noah. It wasn't given to all of us. So as we read the Bible, we understand there are some things that have universal application for everyone, other things that are limited, and that's the case when we talk about some of the things regarding the Holy Spirit and the apostles. We're going to focus on some verses from John chapters 14, 15, and 16. In these chapters, the Lord is giving specific instructions and promises to the men that He had chosen to serve as apostles. These were great promises, but they were only given to specific individuals. Some of the confusion that exists over the subject of the Holy Spirit and exactly what the Holy Spirit is to do comes as a result of people misunderstanding the the promises that were given just to the apostles and wanting to make application to themselves. It's important that, that we read these chapters as the Lord speaking to the apostles in realizing they are receiving special instructions from Him that would help them to do their work as apostles, these are not necessarily promises that were to be shared by all Christians of all time. John chapters 14 through 16, these, are, these chapters contain the Lord's farewell address to His apostles. This would be the last time that He is speaking with them before His death, and before His resurrection from the dead. He's doing His best to prepare them, not just for His death, but also to prepare them for the work they would be doing as apostles after He leaves this world. I know He will spend 40 days with them after He's risen from the dead, but at that time, the Scriptures do not tell us how much time He actually spends with the apostles. He's doing the best He can to prepare them at this time. He is going to speak of the Holy Spirit four different times in these chapters. We're going to look at these verses. Chapter 14, verses 15 through 18, and verse 26. Chapter 15, verses 26 and 27. Chapter 16, verses 7 through 15. And it's in these verses that we're going to get the idea. We're going to get the picture. We're going to come to understand just exactly what the Holy Spirit would do for the apostles. First thing that I want us to notice is that Jesus promised a helper, or He promised a comforter to them. In John chapter 14, 
verses 16 through 18. Let's read these verses. I won't have the verses up on the, on the slides. Uh, we're, we're looking at three chapters here. We're, we'll open up our Bibles. We'll read the verses uh, from our Bibles. John chapter 14, verses 16 through 18. And I will pray the Father, and He will give you another Helper, that He may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Now, Jesus was leaving them. He's already made that announcement here at the beginning of chapter 14, and this is causing them distress, but what He's telling them, He's assuring them that He is not deserting them as orphans. They're not going to be left alone. He is going to send another helper to them. The helper is identified by the Lord as the Spirit of Truth, verse 17, or down in verse 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is going to be their helper, is going to be their comforter. The word helper or comforter, depending on your translation, comes from the Greek word parakletos. There is not a single English word that can accurately translate or convey the meaning of this word parakletos. The word literally means to call to one side or to be an aid to someone. And so Jesus is saying, I'm going to leave you, but I'm going to send someone who will come to your side and stand with you and hold you up and support you in the work that I have for you to do. The word parakletos is only found five times in the New Testament. Four times it's found in these chapters, and it refers to the Holy Spirit. The fifth time it's found in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, and there it speaks of Jesus. We're going to be looking in these chapters at, at the Holy Spirit as the helper or the parakletos. The Holy Spirit was given to the apostles as a unique gift in that He was taking the place of Jesus Christ in their work and in their mission. The Holy Spirit was another helper who was comparable to Christ, but in a way, he was not like Christ. That's what he announces in these verses. He is, he is comparable to Christ in that he's coming to aid them and help them in their work, but the way the Spirit will be unlike Christ is that just as Christ is being taken from them, the Spirit would not be taken from them. The Spirit would remain with them and, and would abide with them forever, verse 16 says. So what, what was the Holy Spirit to the apostles? The Holy Spirit was a helper. To the apostles, the Holy Spirit was a comforter who came to their side, who helped them, who, who, who came after the Lord left and filled that void and, and served in that capacity after the Lord left them. As we go through the rest of this study, we're going to see what specific ways the Holy Spirit was a helper or a comforter to, to the apostles. As we continue on, in chapter 14 and verse 26, Jesus says that this helper, the Holy Spirit, would teach them all things and bring all things to their remembrance. John chapter 14, 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So this helper is said to equip the apostles with two things, with inspired teaching and with an, an inspired memory. Two things, two things that you and I don't have as mere mortals. Inspired teaching, direct from God, and an inspired memory. The apostles were inspired by the Holy Spirit as they went forth carrying out the Great Commission. They would speak by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and later they would write by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul explains this somewhat in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 
verses 12 and 13, he says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. He's going to teach them. The Holy Spirit is going to teach them. Verse 13, these things we also speak. Notice the apostles would be taught by the Holy Spirit and then they would in turn teach those things to mankind. These things we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So the Holy Spirit would teach the apostles, would give them inspired teaching. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, it says that the early church there in Jerusalem, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine or in the apostles' teaching. That is, they stayed there in Jerusalem. They committed themselves to that new thing that they had found. They were part of the church and they clung to and continued in the teaching of the apostles. Where did that teaching come from? That teaching came from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave them these things and they in turn taught them to those new disciples there. Human memory is subject to limitations to imperfections, and to bias. We don't always remember everything perfectly. I had a great example of that just a few minutes ago talking with some of our visitors. It took some uh, reminders. Then, okay, all right, now, now I remember. Uh, we don't always remember things exactly the way they happen. You go back to a class reunion and you talk to some classmates that you shared a part of your life with 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago and talk about things that happened and you don't quite remember it the same way. Somebody's, somebody's got it wrong there. The apostles didn't have to deal with that. They didn't have to rely upon their fallible human memories. The Holy Spirit would give them recollection of the things as they needed them. That's part of what was uh, part of what David read for us a few moments ago from Matthew chapter 10. Don't worry about what you're going to say when you're brought before these dignitaries. The Holy Spirit will tell you in that moment what it is that you are supposed to say. Well, it's pretty obvious that only the apostles had this measure of the Holy Spirit. Only the apostles enjoyed this privilege. You remember what we read in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, where Paul writes to Timothy, and by the way, Timothy had a miraculous gift of the Holy Spirit in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 6. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 6, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Timothy had a measure of the Holy Spirit. He had a miraculous gift of the Holy Spirit. But notice he's told in chapter 2 verse 15, Study to show yourself approved unto God. That tells me that Timothy didn't have that automatic divine recall of everything that he had been taught. No, he had to study to present himself approved unto God. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, Peter writes to these Christians and says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you. Isn't that just the opposite of what Jesus told the apostles? He told the apostles, don't worry about what you're going to say. It will be given to you in that hour what you say. The Holy Spirit will give you that. But when Peter writes to these Christians, he says, you be ready with an answer. And that tells me that not everyone enjoyed what the, what the apostles had with the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit was a helper to the apostles in that He gave them divine teaching and a divine remembrance of everything that Jesus had taught them and, and had showed them. The apostles enjoyed that. It's obvious that not every Christian enjoyed that measure of the Holy Spirit. Here's something else. Back to John chapter 15, we see that the Holy Spirit would testify of Christ. Let's turn and look at these verses. John chapter 15, verses 26 and 27. 
John chapter 15, verses 26 and 27. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, He will testify of Me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with Me from the beginning. So the Holy Spirit would come and would testify or bear witness of Christ, and He would equip the apostles to be able to do the same thing. The word witness is a much abused word in our religion, the religious world today. We have a group called Jehovah's Witnesses that are going to come and knock on your door and tell you about Jehovah. They are not witnesses of Jehovah. They are false teachers. They've not witnessed the true and living God. They are spreading lies. When I was in denominationalism, when I was younger, it wouldn't be uncommon for some of us to decide that we were going to go to the mall or we were going to go somewhere else and we were going to do some witnessing. And what we meant by that is we were going to go and try to share our faith with other people. But in that circle, it was called witnessing. And that's how that word was used there. So when, when, John, or when Jesus says that the Holy Spirit is going to testify or bear witness, some people have the idea that, that the Holy Spirit's going to help them to do that as well. Jesus told the apostles that He would send them the Holy Spirit and that the Spirit would take the things that are of Christ and would give it to them, would declare it unto the apostles. In chapter 16, verses 14 and 15, He will glorify Me, for He will take of what is Mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are Mine, therefore I said that He will take of Mine and declare it to you. Jesus told the apostles that He'd send the Holy Spirit to them, and the Spirit would take the things that were His and would give it unto them, declare it unto them. See, the Holy Spirit did not come with His own agenda. He came with marching orders. He was sent to do the work that Christ gave Him to do, just like Jesus didn't come with His own agenda. When Jesus came, He came to do the work and the will that the Father gave Him to do. So when the Holy Spirit was given to the apostles, He continued the work that Christ began with the apostles. And that work was bearing witness of Christ. Together with the Holy Spirit inspiring them, the apostles bore witness to the world of the things that they had seen and they had heard concerning Jesus Christ. If you remember... Well, in, in Acts chapter 2, let's look at Acts chapter 2, verses 32 and 33. Acts chapter 2, verses 32 and 33, Peter is preaching with the rest of the apostles on Pentecost. He says, This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out on this on he poured out this which you now see and hear. Notice how this all began. The Holy Spirit, at the beginning of Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit fell upon the apostles. There was the sound of the mighty rushing wind which drew people in to investigate what is this noise. And when they got there, they saw and they heard the apostles speaking in tongues. And they asked, what is this? What is this that we are witnessing? And Peter answers that question in the verses we just read. What you are witnessing is evidence that God has raised Jesus from the dead because from heaven Jesus has poured out the Holy Spirit on us. So the Holy Spirit did bear witness of Christ. He brought the things that Christ gave him to bring to the apostles, and working with the apostles, the Holy Spirit bore witness of Christ to the world, and continues to do so as his word is read and studied today. No one is a witness of Christ in this sense today. No one succeeded the apostles in their work. This work was done by them, it was accomplished by them. So the Holy Spirit testified of Christ to and through the apostles. 
Here's something else. In John chapter 16, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Let's look here. At, uh, John, rather. John chapter 16, verses 8 through 11. And when He has come, that is the Holy Spirit, and when He has come, He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in Me. Of righteousness, because I go to My Father and you see Me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. This is one of the sections of several in this part of the book of John that make you stop and scratch your head. What is Jesus talking about here? The Holy Spirit would come and He would convict or He would reprove the world. To convict or reprove is to expose someone's actions and condemn them for wrongdoing. And that's exactly what the Holy Spirit would do, and He would do this through the apostles. Jesus is speaking to His apostles here saying, this is what the Holy Spirit's going to do, but the apostles soon learn the Holy Spirit is going to do this through them. All three of these things were accomplished in Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2. So let's keep our place here in John 16, but let's go over to Acts chapter 2. Let's look at this first item. Jesus says that the Holy Spirit would convict the world of sin, and He says specifically in verse 9, because they do not believe in Me. What did Jesus want more than that? When Jesus came into this world, He wanted people to believe in Him, especially His own people. But they didn't. They, as a, a, a crowd with one voice, said, Crucify Him. They rejected Him. Well, in Acts chapter 2, when the Apostle Paul is preaching, Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 24, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Pause right there. Peter is saying, God gave all the evidence you need. You know the signs he did. You know the things this man did. It was proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. Him, verse 23, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified, and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. You did not believe in him. Despite the evidence to the contrary, you did not believe in him. Verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. What did the Holy Spirit do? He convicted them of their sin. What was their sin? Their sin was not believing that Jesus was the Christ just as Jesus said in John chapter 16. Now notice verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Why were they cut to the heart? Because they were convicted. They were convinced that they had done wrong. And they realized it. We have killed our Savior. What shall we do about it? So the Holy Spirit convicted the world of sin, but the Holy Spirit also convicted the world of righteousness. Jesus says in, in John chapter 16, verse 10, of righteousness because I go to the Father. How is that the Holy Spirit convicting the world of righteousness because Jesus goes to the Father? Remember the charge made against Jesus? Blasphemy. He is making himself out to be God. He is saying he is the Son of God. He has committed sin. He has spoken blasphemy. What do you say? He's deserving of death. And so they put him to death on the charge of blasphemy. Three days later, God raised him from the dead. Forty days after that, he called him back to heaven, where he sat down at the Father's right hand. Those Jews said, Jesus, you are guilty. You are guilty of blasphemy. And God from heaven said, He is innocent. 
He is righteous. He is not guilty of that sin. So here's the Holy Spirit convicting these Jews through the preaching of the apostles of righteousness. Not their righteousness, they had none. But they were convicting these Jews of the Lord's righteousness. They killed an innocent man. And God raised him from the dead to prove that. Uh, verses 32 and 33 of Acts chapter 2, This Jesus God raised up, of which we are all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He's poured out this which you now see and hear. I read that verse a few moments ago. When Jesus ascended into heaven, He sat down at the right hand of God. There He was coronated as King. He was declared, among other things, to be innocent. Of all charges, he was declared to be righteous. And then third, the Holy Spirit would convict the world of judgment. John chapter 16, verse 11, Jesus explains, because the ruler of this world is judged. When Jesus died on the cross, Satan appeared to have won. But when that tomb was found empty three days later, Jesus conquered Satan's greatest power. Jesus gained that victory and defeated Satan. While the death of Christ would have looked like a victory for Satan, the resurrection sealed his fate. It was the, the means of Jesus judging and destroying forever the power of the devil. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death. That is the devil. The Lord's resurrection from the dead pronounced judgment over the devil. His kingdom had come to an end. His power had come to an end. And our Lord's resurrection from the dead is what gives him the authority to one day in the future judge the entire world. In Acts chapter 17, Verses 30 and 31, familiar passage to many of us. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because He has appointed a day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom He has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising Him from the dead. When Jesus rose from the dead, He gained that privilege, that authority to one day judge the world. This is the message that the Holy Spirit brought through the apostles. He convicted the world, starting with the Jews and going onward from there. He convicted the world of the sin of unbelief, that Jesus was righteous, He was the sinless Son of God, and that He one day will judge the world in righteousness. This is something that the Holy Spirit did through the apostles. And the apostles no doubt had no way of knowing how the Holy Spirit was going to do this, but he did it through their preaching there on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. What else? Going back to John chapter 16, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would guide the apostles into all truth. John 16, verses 12 and 13. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Jesus had not taught the apostles all the truth that they needed to hear. He said, I still have many things to say to you. Wouldn't you hate to hear a preacher say that at this point in his sermon? (laughs) Many things to say to you. But how many of us could sit at the Lord's feet? and listen to him speak forever. But there's only so much that the mind can take. We know that in a few short hours, Peter, James, and John are going to fall asleep while the Lord asks them to stay awake and to pray. They were absorbing all that they could absorb. And the Lord knew that. He understood that. So he told them that the Holy Spirit would come and guide them into all truth. We've already pointed out the Holy Spirit would give them divine teaching and divine or inspired remembrance. Now the promise is that these men, 
would be guided into all truth. And there are some, there are some cap applications we need to make from this, some things we need to understand about this. Have you ever encountered anyone that felt content just following the red letters of the Bible? If, if you've got a Bible that, that's like mine, that the words of Christ are printed in red ink. The rest of them are in black ink. And some have the idea that really all we need are the words of Jesus. And so if it's not written in red, I'm really not interested in that. Well, some of these words that are written in red is John 16, verses 12 and 13, where Jesus says the Holy Spirit is going to give you all truth. And so if we stop just at the words in red, we do not have all truth. We need all Scripture. But here's something else. The Holy Spirit did not reveal a portion of truth to the apostles. The Holy Spirit revealed all truth to these apostles. What does that mean? That means Joseph Smith, who comes along 1,800 years later, doesn't have anything to add to God's revelation. These apostles have all truth. The seven-day Adventists, who insist that they, they receive divine teaching, their prophets receive divine teaching, the Catholic proclamations that come through their popes, not if all truth was given to the apostles in the first century, no. And you add to that the fact that one pope will come along and contradict what an earlier pope said. And that, that continues to happen? No, God does not contradict Himself. How about those who uh, are charismatic today and who believe that the Holy Spirit speaks to them and through them? No. All truth was given to these apostles. As they spoke it, as they wrote it down, as it was recorded for us in Scripture, we have all truth that was given through the Holy Spirit to the apostles. So that was, a, that was a privilege that just the apostles received from the Holy Spirit. He guided them into all truth. And then finally, in John chapter 6 and at verse 13, we noted also that the Holy Spirit would tell them of things to come. So there would be some things that, that would happen in the future that the Lord didn't necessarily instruct them about, but the Holy Spirit later would come and instruct them about these things that would happen in the future. And we read these in the epistles. Uh, the falling away. Paul talks about this in 2 Thessalonians 2 and, and 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1-3. through 3. The Spirit expressly says... In latter days, men will fall away from the truth. So the Holy Spirit revealed these things to the apostles. The second coming of Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapters 4 and 5. The apostle Paul gives detailed instructions regarding that. That's not information that the Lord taught his apostles. The resurrection of the dead. That is our hope as Christians to be raised from the dead. Uh, the Lord didn't talk a lot about that, but there's, there's much instruction given on that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And the triumph of the church over the tyranny of Rome, that's what the book of Revelation is all about. So the Holy Spirit not only guided these apostles into all truth, they told them of things that would come. And these things they have written down in the Scriptures for us. The Lord made great promises to the apostles regarding the help they would receive from the Holy Spirit. What you and I as good Bible students need to understand is that these promises were limited to the apostles. The Holy Spirit is not a helper or a comforter for us in the sense that He was for the apostles. You know who our helper is? You know who our comforter is? I mentioned before, the only other time that word parakletos is used is in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, where it speaks of Jesus being our comforter. 1 John 2 verse 1, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. That word advocate is translated from parakletos. He is our helper. He is our comforter. He comes to our aid 
when we are praying, when we are seeking God's help in our lives, in our service. So what does that mean? Does that mean that the Holy Spirit helped the apostles but doesn't help us today? No, not at all. You and I benefit from the work that the Holy Spirit did through the apostles. As the Holy Spirit taught them all things, reminded them of all things, and guided them into all truth, they wrote it down. And when you and I go to the Scriptures and read what they wrote, we can understand all things that have been revealed to us from Christ through the Holy Spirit. We should be thankful for the work the Holy Spirit did through the apostles, although we do not share in those privileges today. Appreciate so very much you following along as we have been swimming in the deep end of the pool this evening and taking a look at the whole... But anytime you study the Holy Spirit, you're looking at the deep and meaty things of the Word of God. But these are some things that we need to understand. We need to equip ourselves with these truths to be able to teach others. But I think even more than that, it helps to build up our faith to know that we benefit from the work that the Holy Spirit did through the apostles. If you're here and you're not yet a Christian, not yet a child of God, you need to become one. You need to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, confess your faith, repent of your sins, and be baptized in water to have those sins washed away. If you've done that, but you become unfaithful, if you're overwhelmed and you need our encouragement, whatever your need is, would you let it be made known by coming forward as we stand and sing this invitation song?